encourage you now to take out your Bibles and be turning in the Old Testament to Deuteronomy chapter 18. And you may want to place a finger or a ribbon marker in your Bible there because we are going to be referring throughout our study together this morning between Deuteronomy chapter 18 and the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament. Beginning today and stretching over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at the threefold work of Jesus Christ, this threefold traditional designation of his ministry as prophet, priest, and king. And so today we are going to look at what I would take to be the primary passage in the Old Testament anticipating his prophetic Office. There are many passages that would point to the fact that Jesus would be uh, the ultimate revealer of the divine truth. And yet, perhaps no other passage speaks so extensively and clearly to that idea as Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning now at verse 15. Let's read the word of the Lord. Moses is writing and speaking and says this, Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of Yahweh your God at Horeb on the day of assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And Yahweh said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, How may we know the word that Yahweh has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that Yahweh has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's bow and ask God's blessing on our study together. Heavenly Father, we are excited and thankful for this time of year and for the opportunity now over the next several weeks to reflect on our Savior Jesus. We pray, Father, that as we look into your word this morning, that you would help us, that you would bless us, that you would work within our hearts through the preached word, that we might have a greater appreciation for the work of your Son as your ultimate and final prophet. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we would heed all that he has to say. In Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen. So Christ would be the prophet like Moses. This is undoubtedly a messianic prophecy. Although, interestingly enough, the Jews in Moses' day and in subsequent generations would not necessarily have recognized it as such. Within uh, Judaism, from the time of Moses to the time of Christ, and even in uh, the several centuries after the time of Christ, particularly in that period that we think of as Second Temple Judaism, which describes Judaism after the return from Babylonian exile, after the temple is reconstructed in the days of Ezra, and then leading up into the time that we think of as the time of Christ and the apostles. Second Temple Judaism had many different ideas about who the Messiah would be, and what his specific role might be. Now we look back as Christians, with the help of the Holy Spirit, standing on this side of the cross, we look back at the Old Testament, and we see many different prophecies, all culminating ultimately in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so we recognize that Jesus is the son of David who will sit on David's throne. Jesus is the son of God to whom Yahweh will give uh, victory over his enemies. Jesus is the suffering servant described by Isaiah who will be struck for the sins of God's people. And we would see that Jesus is the prophet like Moses who is described in the passage before us. 
But in Second Temple Judaism, there would not necessarily be the recognition by all the Jews of the unity of these prophecies. In fact, many of the Jews would have expected more than one uh, coming character, a Messiah type character who would be David's son and would reign over the people of Israel and hopefully give them freedom from their enemies, but also other characters that they might have expected, one perhaps the prophet that Moses describes here. They would not necessarily recognize, at least not all of them, that all of these prophecies would ultimately be fulfilled in one person who is Jesus Christ. It would be difficult to believe that because after all, just as we see in the New Testament, the Jews in Jesus' day could not understand how the Messiah who would reign could also be handed over to the Romans and crucified. And of course, the Jews who struggled the most to understand that were the apostles themselves. But here in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses is describing an eschatological prophet. A prophet who will come in the, in the days to come. One who would be like Moses and taken from among the brothers. In other words, from among the people of Israel. And yet who would speak the word of Yahweh with clarity and with authority. There is a significance to this prophecy that we don't need to overlook. Because you could look at Deuteronomy chapter 18 and say, well, yes, of course, Yahweh is going to raise up another prophet, Moses. He's going to raise up many other prophets. There will be men like Samuel and Elijah and Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of the literary prophets whose works are found at the end of our English Old Testaments. The Lord sent all of those men as prophets to Israel and every one of them spoke the word of the Lord. But Moses is not talking about any of those men. And we know that several different ways. One of the ways that we know that Moses does not have reference in general to the prophetic class is that he emphasizes twice in this paragraph that the prophet that he is speaking of would be like him, like Moses. And none of the later prophets were like Moses. Now you could say, oh, sure they were. There were many similarities. The, the prophets who came in the subsequent age uh, spoke God's word in the same authoritative way that Moses himself spoke it. And that certainly is true. That's a point of similarity. But the similarities quickly disappear and the areas of contrast appear because Moses inaugurates a new covenant between God and his people. None of the subsequent prophets did so. Moses delivers the law to the people. He doesn't just preach the law. He doesn't just teach or explain or apply the law. He actually brings the law from the mountain to the people of God. Moses is a redeemer who leads the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And, and the, the New Testament would even go so far as to describe the Red Sea crossing as a baptism of Israel into Moses himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. And in none of those respects are the subsequent prophets at all like Moses. But in every one of those respects, Jesus not only is like Moses, but he actually exceeds Moses in every way. So let's think about this for a second. First of all, Christ would be a prophet like Moses. And there is that special sense that we're describing right now in which this would be true of a relationship between Christ and Moses that was not true of a comparison between Moses and any other prophet. They're both miracle workers. Most of the prophets were not. They are both saviors. They are both lawgivers. They are both intercessors. Think about the occasion in Exodus chapter 32 when the children of Israel at the base of Mount Sinai construct a golden calf and begin dancing and cavorting and fornicating around it. The Lord on the mountain sees the sin of the people and declares that he will destroy them for their iniquity and raise up a new generation, a new nation from Moses himself. And Moses stands in the gap, the, the, the psalmist describes in Psalm 106. Moses stands in the gap between the wrath of God and the object of that wrath, the children of Israel. And he intercedes on behalf of the people. 
Does that sound familiar at all? Does that sound like anyone else you know? What does Jesus do on the cross? He stands in the gap. He stands between the wrath of God and the object of that wrath. Not to take us down that rabbit trail too far, but just as an aside, one of the ways in which Christ excels Moses in this regard is seen in that very episode where Moses speaks to Yahweh and says, Lord, pardon the sin of this people, and if you will not, then blot my name out of your book of life. And the Lord says... I'll blot out who I decide to blot out. Moses is not able to offer himself in place of the people. Neither could Paul. Well, Romans chapter 9 tells us. But what is interesting is Jesus does that very thing. See, Jesus offers himself. He says, let the judgment fall on me and let the people go free. Pour out your wrath on me and let them be free. And in fact... In, the, in Jesus' case, that is accepted by the Father. So Christ is the new Moses. He calls the people out of Egypt. He goes into the wilderness. He is ultimately uh, the lawgiver who intercedes and saves the people for God's own possession. Now hold your place here in Deuteronomy 18 and flip over to Hebrews chapter 3. And let's notice the way in which the Hebrews writer develops this typology, this, this relationship where Moses is the type, the shadow, and Christ is the antitype, the substance, the fulfillment, and indeed the greater fulfillment. Hebrews chapter 3, I'm going to read the first six verses. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God." Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Isn't that interesting? He sees this comparison that we're making. He sees the comparison that we're noting here in Deuteronomy chapter 18. And yet he says while Moses was faithful, Jesus was more faithful. How could that be? Well, Moses was faithful as a servant, but Jesus is faithful as a son. Moses was faithful in the house, but Jesus is the one who built the house. And just as he built the house in which Moses faithfully served, so now he builds his church, the house where we serve to this very day. Jesus is the greater prophet, in other words. He is the fulfillment of all that Moses' life was actually uh, intended to highlight it. And just as an aside again, if you study the, the way in which the Gospel of Matthew is put together, the order in which the stories are told and which stories the Holy Spirit led M Matthew to include that were not included by all of the writers, one of the things that you may observe is that there is a deliberate parallel being drawn between Jesus and Moses, particularly in the first half of that book. Coming back to Deuteronomy 18 for a moment, I want you to, to notice, though, that it is not only Moses that Jesus is said, this prophet is said to be like, but also he is to share a likeness with the people themselves. Notice verse 15, Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. In other words, he will not be a foreigner. He will not be an outsider. He will not simply be deposited on the planet and then assumed back up into heaven as some early Christological heresies held. No, the prophet that Moses is describing would arise from among the people of Israel. Go down uh, to verse 16. Uh, it, or excuse me, not verse 16, verse 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among the brothers. This is the uh, uh, context of the prophet's appearance. The, the Jews knew in Jesus' day that the Messiah would arise from among them. They were expecting him to be a descendant of David. But as we said, they would not necessarily recognize that this prophet that Moses is foretelling would be the same character. 
After all, uh, David's son, he would be the king and he would have that kingly role. But Moses is talking about someone who is not a king, but someone who speaks the word of God. Little did many of them know that the same person will fulfill both prophecies. Now go back to Hebrews for a moment. We're going to flip back and forth quite frequently and we're going to speed it up here. Hebrews chapter 2, I want you now to look with me in verse 14 beginning. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 The writer, whoever he may be, I think we can rule out Paul. Everybody else is up for grabs. But Hebrews 2 verse 14 says this, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, speaking of Christ, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, he the father helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he, Christ, had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. We'll revisit some of these very ideas next week, Lord willing, as we talk about Christ as priest. But notice the emphasis that the Hebrews writer is giving to the humanity of Christ, to the real humanity, that Jesus is truly God and truly man. And most of the errors with regard to the doctrine of Christ that developed in the early history of the church were errors on one or the other side of that equation. One group or one uh, preacher might emphasize the humanity of Christ over the divinity of Christ or vice versa. Might emphasize the divinity of Christ over the humanity of Christ. But the, the Orthodox Church, through their creeds and confessions, through their teaching, affirmed what Scripture affirms. And that is the true humanity and the true divinity. That Jesus is truly God and it is appropriate and right in the fullest sense to describe Him as God. And yet He is truly man. He has not just a body, but a true human nature. One person, two natures, both divine and human. Go over to chapter 4 of the book of Hebrews and see this uh, emphasized again, beginning in verse 14. Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help In time of need, Jesus experienced every kind of temptation that you and I struggle against. Now, you may say, well, there's a lot of temptation in the world today that didn't even exist in Jesus's world. And I would say not many different kinds of temptation. There are different avenues for temptation. Yes, that's true that Jesus didn't have smartphones and the Internet and uh, and all of the the uh, print and visual media that we have today that just kind of surrounds us with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and appeals to us on those bases. But the same basic temptations were present in Jesus' world and in Jesus' day as are true today. And he experienced every kind of temptation that we have, and yet he never sinned. He knows by experience what temptation is like, and yet he never sinned. My favorite writer in the medieval period is Anselm, who wrote an entire work on why God became man, dealing with the question of the atonement, pointing out the very idea that I'm trying to suggest to you today. And that is that Jesus had to be truly God and he had to be truly man to ultimately accomplish the work that God gave him to perform. And we find that hinted at even as far back as the book of The books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Now let's go back to Deuteronomy 18 for a minute. It's not only the humanity of Christ, the the fact that Jesus would be like Moses, he would be a second Moses, and he would be like the brothers and come from among them. But it's also the divinity of Christ that is highlighted in this paragraph that we're looking at. Pick up again at verse 16. Uh, Moses reminds them of their experience a generation before at Mount Sinai. 
He says, just as you desired of Yahweh your God at Horeb on the day of assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh my God, let me not see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And Yahweh said, they are right in what they have spoken. Now this describes a part of the story that I have found many people uh, apparently overlook. And that is that in Exodus chapter 20, when Israel gathers at the base of Mount Sinai, the presence of God descends in a representative form on the mountain. There is a great earthquake, there is fire, there's billows of smoke, there is the sound of a trumpet blast that sounds loud and long and goes on and on and on. And then God speaks audibly. In the hearing of the people, they hear the voice of Yahweh And they hear the Ten Commandments from Himself. This voice thundering out of the heavens off of the mountain. And the people were terrified by that. And they are the ones who say, if God continues to deliver the law to us in this form or fashion, it will kill us. Moses, you go get the law and we will be glad to listen to it and obey it when you bring it back. And we might be inclined to be critical of Israel at that moment and say, see, that's the whole problem. They wanted distance from God. They wanted separation. And that's what led to their idolatry. No, actually, the Lord says it was that spirit that would keep them from idolatry if they retained it. That was exactly the right attitude to have. It was an appropriate fear of God. The only reason a golden calf was created six weeks later was because the people forgot that fear. They no longer stood in awe of the presence and the power of God. They wanted a God that did not frighten them. And that is the appeal of idolatry. And yet God says this in Deuteronomy 18. Verse 18, in responding to that initial awe at the presence and power of God, he says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So what is this prophet going to do? He is going to mediate God's presence and God's word. He is going to be the representative of God, the mediator for God that the people can hear. Because when they were confronted with the presence of God at Mount Sinai, it nearly killed them. And the Lord says, good. I'm glad that they felt that way. I'm glad that they said what they said. I will raise up a prophet who will bring my presence, my powerful word, and they will hear him. And Jesus Christ is the manifestation of that. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 1. Jesus fulfills that expectation. In fact, this is the very way that the letter to the Hebrews begins. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, says this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days... He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He, speaking of Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, you can't say those things about Moses. You can't say those things about any other prophet that God ever sent. But you can say those things about Jesus. Jesus Christ manifests and mediates the presence and the power of God in a way that we can hear. Do you remember what Jesus in the upper room in John chapter 14 says to His disciples as He's describing His departing from them? And He says, where I am going you know and the way you know. And and Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. And then Philip responds and says, well, if that's indeed the case, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. And and Jesus says, have I been with you so long and you don't yet know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, Jesus is not saying that he, God the Son, is the Father, but he's saying to see him is to see the Father. 
Because Jesus manifests and mediates the presence and the power of God that was displayed at Mount Sinai. And it terrified the people. And yet Jesus is that mediator of God's presence to whom we can hear or to whom we can listen. Whom we will hear. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. The children of Israel are not feeling invited into the presence of God at Mount Sinai whenever the, the ground is shaking and the, and the, the mountain itself is, is a burning like a, a, like a volcano. They didn't feel invited into the presence of God that day. But Jesus invites us into God's very presence. Going back to Deuteronomy 18, look at verse 19. Whoever will not listen to my words that he, this prophet, shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Now there's a sense in which you could argue that that was true of every prophet that the Lord ever sent. In fact, we have a fascinating historical example of this in Numbers chapter 16. Where Korah, Dathan, and Abiram rise up against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. And they make a very logical and very erroneous argument. They say, are not all of the people holy to the Lord? Of course they were. Does the, does the Lord not dwell among all of the people? Of course He does. Therefore, it's wrong for Moses and Aaron to exalt themselves as leaders over the congregation. Well, no, actually that's not true because it was the Lord who sanctified the people and who was present among them who had exalted Moses and Aaron to that very position. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram paid for their error with their lives. Because anyone who rejected the messenger of God and the word that that messenger brought was in fact rejecting God Himself. But if that is true, how much more true is it that to reject the Son of God who is Himself described as the Logos, the Word of God, how much greater an error is it to reject Jesus Go back to Hebrews now, to chapter 2, and look at the first four verses of chapter 2. Hebrews 2, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord... And it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. You notice the argument the Hebrews writer is making there? He's saying if the word that God sent by angels in the Old Testament was authoritative, and if transgressions of it were punished, then how much greater an error would it be to reject the word of God Himself revealed and distributed by the Son. Go over to chapter 10 of Hebrews and look at the same idea as the Hebrews writer is drawing to a point of application in his argument. Notice what he says, Hebrews 10 and verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which He was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know Him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge. Pay attention to this. It's not the world, but in this passage it is the Lord will judge His People, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, if that's not a sobering passage of Scripture, I don't think there is a sobering passage of Scripture in the Bible. Imagine for a moment the error if one of my young sons is given instruction from his mother, but mediated through the mouth of his sister. So Kirstie tells Hannah or Ellen Beth, go in the other room and tell the boys it's time to pick up the toys and start getting ready for bed. And the boys ignore that message. They ignore the messenger, they disregard it completely, and they go on doing what boys do, right? Is that an error? 
Is that a sin? Is that an act of disobedience? Of course it is. Are they going to be punished? They certainly will be. Of how much greater guilt and of what greater punishment are they going to be subject to if their mother walks in the room and says, boys, it's time to pick up the toys and start getting ready for bed, and they disregard her. See, that's the issue that the Hebrews writer is pointing out. Yes, to disregard the Word of God delivered through Moses is a great sin and worthy of punishment and condemnation. But if you reject the Word of God presented by God the Son, better to be Korah, who in his rebellion against God's chosen leaders was swallowed by the earth and taken to Sheol alive. Better to be Korah than to be the person who has scorned and spurned the Son of God. And then coming back to Deuteronomy 18 for just a moment more, the authenticity of this prophet. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 20, Moses says, The prophet who presumes to speak a word in God's name that he has not commanded, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Posing as a prophet was a capital crime in Israel, which is a saving grace for many preachers today who take God's name in vain regularly and yet, fortunately for them, I suppose, are not subject to being stoned for doing so. The third commandment says you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And we often apply that rightly, I think, to the profane uses of the name of God. You shouldn't use the name of God unless you're speaking to God or about Him. And we should treat His name as holy. And we are taught in the Lord's Prayer to, to pray that very thing, that God's name might be treated as holy, that it might be hallowed in our lives and in this world in which we live. And yet there is a larger way in which we take God's name in vain when we take the name of God upon our lips and upon ourselves, and yet we do or say or promote that which is not of God. The test of faithfulness is not a preacher or prophet's eloquence or his seeming effectiveness, the success that he may have in a numerical way, the appeal that he has for the people before whom he speaks. The test of faithfulness is the correspondence of his message with truth. Whether what He is saying is what God Himself has said. And the only way you can evaluate that is to compare what a prophet or preacher today may say with the words contained in the Bible. But Jesus has proven His faithfulness in this regard. Go over to Hebrews again. Chapter 5 now, verse 7 beginning. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. In the days of His flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to Him who was able to save Him from death. And He was heard because of His reverence. Jesus is reverent. Jesus treats the Father as holy. And we do not. What sense would that make? Jesus shows greater reverence for His Father. Jesus, who is Himself God, shows greater reverence for His Father than many prophets who take the name of God in vain. In verse 8, although He was a son, He learned obedience through what He suffered. Jesus had to learn obedience. He experienced obedience by submitting Himself to the Father's will, even to the point of suffering, even to the point of death. How does that compare to the ministries of so many false prophets since the time of Moses, even to this day. Verse 9, And being made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey Him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Do you see how the Hebrews writer is appealing to the faithfulness of Christ in order to point to the superiority of His ministry and the certainty of the hope that we can have in Him? It may be, it, this, this, I thought about this using this passage, that this one might be a little more subtle. But I hope you can see that the argument is from Christ's proven faithfulness in treating the Father with reverence, in submitting His own will to the Father's will, in suffering even to the point of death, and being made perfect thereby. 
And then in the very next chapter, Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 13, listen to the way the Hebrews writer compares the continuity of Jesus' ministry with the continuity of God's revelation in ages before. Verse 13 of Hebrews 6, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of His purpose, He guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, We who have fled for refuge may have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. You say, what in the world does all this have to do? This is God making a promise to Abraham, taking an oath. And yes, God is unchangeable and God cannot lie. God is truth. And now God who is truth and cannot lie has made. But what does that have to do with Christ? Look at verse 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. His argument is that Jesus is the one who has actually secured fulfillment of that oath. How authentic is Jesus as God's prophet? How trustworthy is His message So certain that His ministry is that which guarantees the fulfillment of the oath God made 2,000 years before He lived, 4,000 years before now. That's the continuity of God's purpose seen in the ministry of Christ. That Jesus is not coming out with some new innovative approach to religion. That Paul and the other apostles understood Christianity to be the fulfillment of Judaism. And if you ask them whether they were practicing Jews, they would say, of course we are. In fact, Paul in his defense in the latter chapters of Acts says, we are preaching and believing nothing other than what Moses and the prophets taught. This is what they expected. And Jesus is the fulfillment of it. He has proven Himself to be faithful. Back in Deuteronomy 18, verses 21 and 22, The question might be asked, Moses says, how can we know that that a prophet who is proclaiming the word of Yahweh, who is taking the name of God in this way, how can we know whether it's real or not? How can we know whether it's true? In Deuteronomy 18 and verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that Yahweh has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Now, there there is more than one test given even in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 13 actually describes testing, evaluating a prophet's preaching based on prior revelation. And so there is, there is one test for the authenticity of a prophet. But here another test is given, and that is when the prophet makes a claim, when he says this is what's going to come to pass, if it doesn't happen, he's not of God. Because biblical prophecy always comes true. Always. A true prophet, when he speaks, he speaks in a way that corresponds with reality, corresponds with truth. Some religious sects today, amazingly, were founded on false prophecies and continue to this day. And I don't want to be ugly or unkind in pointing this out, but the Watchtower Society, the Jehovah's Witnesses, basically were founded on a false prophecy that did not come to pass. And yet that organization continues to this day. Maybe a little closer to home, the Seventh-day Adventist church. Many people do not realize, but that group began in the very same way. With a false prophecy about the return of Christ that did not come to pass. And yet the consequence of that, the result of that, ended up being a new religious sect. I would have thought that when a prophet made such a claim and then was disproven by the course of events, that his following and followers would fall apart. And there usually has been, historically, divisions within such sects when the false prophecy does not come to pass. And yet, even present day experience tells us that unfortunately there are still many who are willing to follow such false prophets. There is certainly no reason to fear them, Moses says, 
and there is no reason to ever believe them. But what, is, what about Christ's word? Well, back in the book of Hebrews for the last time. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Jesus got it right, and he got it right the first time. He did one work, and that work was effective and will stand forever, even into eternity. His word and His work is proven true. It is finished. It is final. It is ultimate. And so we are called to trust a proven prophet, not someone who comes along and says, I have a word from the Lord and I guess we'll find out in the next several months or years whether in fact this is going to come to pass. No, we don't have to to wait and, and hold faith in abeyance until we see the outcome. We trust in a prophet whose way is already proven and whose work is already done. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, In verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Skip down to verse 18 in the same chapter. For you have not come to what may be touched... A blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. Do you realize what's being described there? It's where we started today, Mount Sinai. And the Hebrews writer says that may be where the sermon started, but it's not where you and I have come. Verse 20. For they could not endure the order that was given. If any, even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you, Christian, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn ones who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's bow and let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we seek to wrap our minds around the greatness of Your Son, we realize that it so far exceeds our capacity that we cannot even touch more than the hem of the garment. Lord, we're thankful for Jesus, Your Son, our Savior, the inaugurator of the new covenant, the lawgiver, the redeemer, the prophet, priest, and king. God, we pray that you would so work in our hearts such faith that we might ever trust in your Son and give careful heed to all that he says. To you be the glory in all things and for all time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.